Iya. So, do you have busy day there? Yeah, it, it has been. Uh, we've we've had multiple admissions today. A couple of cardiac arrests in hospital oh cardiac arrests. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been a busy day. Sale is our senior registrar in intensive care. Hi everyone. Okay. He's uh, not far away from finishing his training. It's nice to join all of you tonight. Is he at uh, Australia, Dr. Subramanian, you are at Australia? Yeah, I'm in uh, Adelaide, uh, Australia. I work together with uh, Dr. Sanap in our IC oh, with okay. Alama McEwen. Okay, great, great. Okay, sir, we keep start? Going? Sorry, yeah, with, yeah. Your, with your permission, can I start, sir? Just yeah. line up. Okay. Oh, so, uh, so good, uh, good evening, everyone. So the, uh, today we'll be starting with our uh, webinar series five. So the today's topic will be mm -hmm. going to be very interesting, and this is on the cardiac output monitoring. And uh, we have a uh, host of uh, panelists and the moderator and uh, the presenter. So I'll just uh, start with the introduction. The today's speaker is Dr. Milin. So Dr. Milin is uh, one of the leading practitioner in Australia. He's attached to uh, two or three uh, good centers. And uh, the primary place of working is, uh, I think, Lille Macron Hospital, if I'm not wrong. And yeah. uh, he is leading a team of intensivists there. So he'll be presenting to us today uh, regarding the cardiac output, which mode, to which modality to choose and which is important. And uh, with us uh, today, the other moderator, I'm Dr. Gunadar. I'm the uh, consultant uh, ICU Apollo Hospital. And with me, my colleague, Dr. Akles, he's also working as an intensivist in Apollo Hospital, uh, Navi Mumbai. And uh, today our panelist will be uh, Dr. Pramod Guru. Dr. Pramod Guru is the leading uh, ECMO specialist in charge, intensivist in Mayo Clinic, uh, United States of America. And with him, uh, the other uh, two panelists are Dr. Niranjan. Dr. Niranjan Panigrahi is from uh, Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. He is also ECMO in charge and uh, intensivist in charge of Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. And with him, uh, Dr. Aditi Jain. Dr. Aditi Jain is a uh, senior consultant and my colleague. She is working with Apollo Hospital, Belapur, and she has basically uh, did her training from the Toronto General Hospital, Canada. And uh, with us, uh, our eminent other panelist, Dr. Amol Kothekar. Amol Kothekar is the associate professor and intensivist in charge, Tata Memorial Hospital. And uh, he is also, his area of interest will be hemody is hemodynamic monitoring. So with that, uh, I'm uh, giving over this session to uh, Dr. Milin, and Dr. Milin is going to speak to us regarding cardiac output monitor, and followed by that, we have 15 to 20 minutes of discussion on the topic, and with after that, there is a 15 minutes, very interesting session by Dr. Milin. So what is the pathway of intensivist and how to uh, enter the Australian system of intensive care practice for the budding intensivist and all the, uh, the critical care fellows? So with this, let's start the session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gunalar, for the introduction. So my name is Dr. Melin Sanap. Uh, I'm intensive care specialist. Uh, uh, I've been practicing in uh, Adelaide, South Australia, for uh, uh, for the uh, last 20 years uh, or more. Uh, my public uh, hospital uh, attachment is in Lamakin Hospital uh, in South Australia, uh, where I'm also supervisor of training uh, for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, it is a public hospital and it's attached to the University of Adelaide. Uh, and uh, I am affiliated with the clinical senior lecturer uh, in uh, Adelaide University. Uh, my private, private practice is based in two hospitals. Uh, one is uh, the uh, Western Hospital, uh, where I'm the co-director of uh, intensive care unit. Uh, and I'm the second hospital, uh, second private hospital is uh, Calvary North Adelaide Hospital where I am the visiting medical officer. Uh, I'm very closely associated with the College of Intensive Care Medicine of uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and I'm on the panel of examiners for the fellowship exam. So today, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the cardiac, monitor, cardiac output monitoring in intensive care unit. Uh, as Gunadar has said, uh, uh, after that, I'm going to talk briefly 
uh, about the, the pathways to enter uh, in the intensive care training in Australia uh, and uh, uh, how the system works. Uh, uh, so uh, the uh, first is the cardiac output monitoring. So basically, uh, it is the volume of blood ejected from the left ventricle per minute. And, uh, and it depends on the preload, contractility, heart, heart rate, and afterload. Uh, so basically, heart rate into stroke volume is equal to cardiac output. So I'm going to talk about the cardiac monitoring system, uh, what, uh, what I use in, in my unit, how, what I practice. Uh, and what is the evidence around. Uh, I would also like to know, and I would like to hear from the panelists what they practice in, in their unit. Uh, so uh, there are many methods uh, of uh, measuring the cardiac output. Uh, an important one is to assess uh, a patient clinically. Uh, and then there are invasive methods and uh, non-invasive methods or uh, minimally invasive methods. So, it is very important to assess a, a patient and assess their end organ perfusion to determine the cardiac output. And that's, that's the, the most important thing. If we think there is a hypoperfusion to the organ, like brain, kidneys, tissues, skin, that means the cardiac output is likely affected. So in terms of the brain, a, a patient is confused, has got decreased level of consciousness, there is decreased urine output in regards to the kidneys or rising lactate or increased capillary uh, refilling time. That's where I'll be concerned about the cardiac output. It is very important to know blood pressure may not correlate uh, to the end uh, organ perfusion. Some of the patients with the low blood pressure can have uh, good organ perfusion, even with the 90 systolic blood pressure and some of the patients, even with the high uh, blood pressure, 140, 150, may not have uh, adequate perfusion. Uh, and, uh, so, and also, uh, the hypotension may not correlate with the cardiac output. And many uh, patients who are hypotensive, uh, septic shock, they may have high cardiac output status as well. So uh, those are the keys. Now, uh, Briefly, I'll uh, talk about the, the, the invasive, just uh, to, to name few invasive and then few non-invasive or, uh, or minimal invasive techniques. And then we'll discuss what I use more often in, in my intensive care unit. So these are the few techniques uh, uh, most of us uh, uh, are aware. Pulmonary artery catheter, PICO, uh, there is LIRCO, transitable echocardiogram, and some of the non-invasive techniques or minimal invasive techniques are esophageal Doppler or the flow track uh, technology. Now, I must say uh, the most common method what I use in my practice is the pulmonary artery catheter. And that is there since long time and, and it is still remains the key uh, for the practice, uh, uh, for, uh, for the monitoring of the cardiac output for the critical ill patients. Uh, so, uh, pulmonary artery catheter, which is also called a swan gas catheter, is the dye dilution technique uh, used uh, for, for the determination of the cardiac output, uh, which is uh, done with the thermodilution, where intermittent known volume of the cold saline is injected uh, with the distal thermistor. And that's how uh, we measure the cardiac output. It also helps to determine the pulmonary artery capillary wave pressure and I'll go through uh, the, some of those things. Uh, and it uses modified Stewart-Hamilton equation. And modified Stewart-Hamilton equation is uh, depend on the amount of dye injected and the concentration gradient within one cycle of the cardiac output. And, and that's what is used uh, to determine uh, the cardiac output. What we can measure with the PA catheter. There are a lot of things what we can do, lots and lots. Uh, so there are some direct measurements and some are the indirect measurements, what we can do. And direct measurements are central venous pressure, uh, we can do right-sided intracardiac pressure uh, or the RA pressure, 
pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, uh, and we uh, uh, did find, uh, we can measure the cardiac output. Another important thing, the mixed venous oxygen saturation directly from the pulmonary artery. That's what we can do. Uh, these are the measurements we can do. And as we can see, we can get the idea about the left side of the heart as well as the right side of the heart. There's some of the indirect measurements what we can uh, uh, we can measure with the with the PA catheter, and uh, and those are uh, uh, systemic vascular resistance uh, and the pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, we can determine the cardiac index. We can determine the stroke volume and the oxygen delivery and the oxygen uptake. Those are the things we can uh, measure with the use of the uh, PA catheter. What are the indications? Uh, there are many, many indications to put the PA catheter in critically ill patients. Shock status, any, any shock status, cardiogenic shock, uh, uh, septic shock, uh, obstructive shock, and, and uh, generally my practice is someone who is on uh, who is shocked and who is on vasopressor uh, around 20 of noradrenaline to determine their cardiac output by some meaning and, and it could be likely with the pulmonary artery catheter. Uh, there are cardiovascular condition, uh, complications of the cardiac condition, cardiogenic shock, uh, left ventricular failure, uh, pulmonary conditions like acute pulmonary hypertension or acute on chronic pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and then uh, around the cardiac surgery, uh, perioperatively, uh, preoperatively for optimization, intraoperatively or postoperatively uh, for the hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, then the fluid requirement and the effectiveness of the therapy we can assess from, uh, uh, from the PA catheter. Patients uh, who are critically ill with the multi-organ failure, uh, renal failure, hepatic failure, uh, uh, shock and profoundly hypoxic uh, respiratory failure, we can use the PA catheter. It can be used for the diagnostic reason and it can be used for the therapeutic reasons. And uh, uh, so briefly, we talked about the, the shock status we can use. Uh, it, it helps to determine the type of shock, whether it's a high cardiac output shock or it's a low cardiac output shock. And uh, also to differentiate between the type of edema whether it's a cardiogenic pulmonary edema or it's a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And that's where we can determine with the use of the PA catheter. And evaluation of the pulmonary hypertension, again, acute or chronic, and, and uh, diagnosis of the pericardial tamponade. Those are the, the indication and, and use of the PA catheter uh, as a diagnostic tool. And it can be used for the therapeutic reason when a patient of shock uh, who is on high doses of uh, vasopressors, and we can initiate the, the therapy with the inotropes, and then we can determine, we can choose what we want to use. We want to use uh, which inotrope we want to use. Uh, is there a role for the mildrenone? Is there a role for the uh, uh, for dobutamine? Now, is there a role for the vasopressin? And we can determine the therapy uh, uh, in a shock patient with the use of the PA catheter. Uh, also perioperatively uh, uh, management of the unstable cardiac patients is not only the, the cardiac patients and the cardiac surgery, but the patients who are having surgery for the non-cardiac reason with the cardiac comorbidity, also we can use the PA catheter. And uh, uh, also in the complicated myocardial infarction uh, with, the, with the heart failure, with the uh, shock mm. and uh, we talk about the cardiac surgery, the severe uh, preeclampsia uh, for guide for the pharmacological therapy and the fluid therapy, uh, burns, renal failure, heart failure, sepsis, decompensated cirrhosis. In many of those group of patients, PA catheter is useful uh, to, uh, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, PA catheter is useful to uh, uh, as a therapeutic uh, uh, a tool and also assess the response of the pulmonary hypertension to the specific therapy, whether the pulmonary hypertension is acute or chronic. 
if it is acute, if we have started some therapy, we have started mildrenone, we have started nitric oxide, whether the patient is responsive to that therapy or not, we can determine by monitoring the, the, the PA pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, and that's where the PA catheter is, is useful. Also, the patient with the chronic pulmonary hypertension, when we need to start them on the therapy like bosentan, sildenafil, we can use the PA catheter, assess their response to the, the, the nitric oxide uh, and see if they are responsive or not and determine the therapy. That's how uh, the PA catheters can be used. Are there many contraindications? Not really. There are not, not much contraindication to put PA catheter. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, if there is an infection at the insertion site, uh, then always you can use another site. Uh, uh, if there is a right, right ventricular assist device, probably that's the contraindication, but that's a very rare condition. Uh, and uh, relative contraindications, which are coagulopathy, thrombosis, Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, relative contraindication are like coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, severe electrolyte imbalance. That can be corrected easily. We can correct those and then insert the PA catheter. So there are very few contraindications to put the PA catheter. Now, in terms of the insertion of the PA catheter, I just briefly talk about the decision, preparation, equipments, and techniques. So decision in my practice, my unit is, is the decision is at the consultant level. Once we decide to put the PA catheter, that, that means the patient is critically ill and that decision is at the consultant level. And, and the, the PA catheter only uh, we allow senior registrar to put or the registrar under the supervision of the senior registrar or the consultant, or I prefer to put myself. Uh, preparation, most of the preparation, uh, it's, uh, it's just like the central venous uh, line preparation. So I won't go in details uh, of that uh, under fully aseptic precautions. And uh, uh, the equipments uh, are also uh, exactly like uh, central uh, uh, venous line uh, and additional PA catheter, which uh, we'll see in a minute and uh, uh, with the cell danger technique. Uh, and this is the PA catheter, uh, which uh, has got, uh, uh, this is the PA catheter, and this is the thermistor connection. And then there are two ports, the proximal infusion port and the, the distal uh, infusion port, uh, and the right ventricular port. And we'll, uh, we'll go through the waveforms in a minute. And, and this is the balloon inflation port uh, to inflate the balloon uh, of the PA catheter. Uh, so, some of the newly modified PA catheters, they come with the additional port and uh, there are uh, thermistor connection, uh, two uh, connectors, one for the, uh, the injection uh, of the saline or the dye and uh, other is uh, just the, for, for the uh, measurement uh, of the value. And there is additional continuous oximetry cable connector. Uh, so some of them get with the additional but most of the time we just use the standard one. Uh, so PA catheter goes to the sheath, uh, which is 7.5 French. And this is the sheath, which is uh, the, the single lumen sheath. But not, uh, nowadays the MAC catheter, which comes with the multi-lumen sheath as well. So PA catheter fits in for both. Uh, and we can choose any of those. In mostly uh, I use the single uh, uh, lumen sheath. Uh, while insertion of the PA catheter. And because there are multiple lumens, you can get anyway. Uh, and, uh, and, and there is a, this protective sheet as well uh, of the PA catheter. Now, briefly, I'll talk about the, how we introduce and, and the, the waveforms. Now, the PA catheter uh, is it's, it's, uh, through, the, through the center line. You can use a, any line, so uh, internal jugular vein, left or right, you can choose any of those. 
subclavian, left or right, and, and uh, occasionally the femoral vein uh, one can use. Mostly I prefer to use the internal jugular where the PA catheter just goes smoothly in. And once it is in the right atrium, balloon is inflated. And once the balloon is inflated, then it, it floats from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And before it goes to the right atrium, look at the waveform in the right atrium. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute again. And once it reaches to the right ventricle, you will see the change in the waveform. And, and once it reaches to the pulmonary artery, again, the change in the uh, another waveform. And when it is going uh, in the left or right pulmonary artery, and when the balloon is inflated, you get the pulmonary artery wedge pressure. Uh, and this is again the same thing uh, in, in this slide, uh, the central venous pressure or the, uh, the right atrial pressure, right ventricle pressure, PA pressure, and the pulmonary uh, capillary wedge pressure. Uh, uh, very important uh, to know that when advancing the catheter, always inflate the tips from the, uh, uh, when the catheter is in the right atrium so that balloon uh, floats and, and uh, advances from one chamber to another. And when withdrawing, make sure balloon is deflated and so that it does not uh, cause uh, the bleeding uh, and the hemorrhage. Uh, never inflate the balloon against the register, but that's where is the risk of the pulmonary artery rupture, which can lead to catastrophic hemorrhage. Uh, so it's a rare complication, but as long as we are aware of the complication. Uh, and as we have uh, briefly seen, so we can get the waveforms from the right atrium, right ventricle, and the pulmonary artery. And uh, uh, so uh, first is the right atrium, and normal right atrial pressures are about uh, uh, zero to seven. And, uh, uh, and look at the waveforms uh, in the right atrium with the AC, uh, X-wave, atrial contraction, tricuspid valve closure, and the atrial diastole, and then uh, we can also see the passive atrial filling uh, and, uh, and the atrial emptying. Can somebody tell me the causes where we can see the abnormal right atrial? We have the increase the right atrial pressure, the, the question uh, mainly for the, the DNB candidates. Anyone? Speak up. Sir, I think, uh, yeah, one one is uh, one choice uh, or one somebody has put that is a severe TR yeah. and yeah. second is in the atrial fibrillation. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's good. The uh, atrial fibrillation, we get uh, abnormal, so that's for sure. Elevated are uh, the diseases of the right ventricle, like right ventricle infarction, cardiomyopathy, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary stenosis, left to right shunt, even the pericardial diseases, left ventricle systolic failure, hypervolumia, and atrial fibrillation, you are spot on. There is a loss of A waves in atrial flutter and fibrillation, uh, and the tall uh, V waves can be seen in the tricuspid regurgitation, and the giant uh, cannon A waves in the VT, ventricle facing, complete heart block, and, uh, and tricuspid stenosis. So, uh, those are the conditions we can get the abnormal right atrial waveforms. Right ventricle pressures, uh, systolic uh, right ventricle pressures are 15 to 25, and uh, the diastolic are 3 to 12. Uh, and uh, that's the uh, waveform. Again, we can see uh, the, the, the systole and the, the diast end diastole. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, uh, and then there is a slow uh, feeling phase. Uh, again, uh, the condition where we can have abnormal right ventricle pressure. Anyone? Somebody has replied like severe PH, pulmonary artery hypertension. 
yeah. And pulmonary embolism. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Mm, so, which uh, can cause uh, the ultimate right ventricular ischemia and infarction as well. The increase uh, pulmonary pressure, uh, somebody mentioned, very good, well done. And the pulmonary valve disorders, which can cause increase in the right uh, ventricular pressure. Very good. Uh, then the PA pressures. And, uh, uh, the, and just before we go to the PA uh, pulmonary artery, there the risk of arrhythmia is, is highest or greatest while the catheter is in the right ventricle. So it has to be moved quite quickly. And, and uh, the technique, how the float is, you have to just rapidly float it like, like a floating a kite. And, and that's how it, it goes quickly, not, not slowly, slowly. So just a little bit mm, quick and, and then mm, stopping uh, in, in the small uh, reaction. That's how it goes uh, quickly and floats quickly. Uh, one of the technique, uh, how we can uh, place it uh, in the right spot in quick period of time. Uh, and uh, when the catheter tip passes uh, pulmonary valve, the diastolic pressure increase and characteristic diacrotic notch appears in the waveform. And I'll show that in a minute. And uh, and uh, uh, systolic pressures are about 15 to 25. And this is important number to know because that's how we divide the pulmonary hypertension. Where, and when the pressures are high, the mild, moderate, severe, after that. Uh, so that systolic PA uh, art, you know, pressure is very important. Uh, and this is the waveform, uh, systole and the diastole and the diacrotic notch of the poor PA, uh, pulmonary artery. And the causes, it can be acute uh, causes, it can be acute on chronic and uh, or the chronic. Uh, acute causes we often see uh, in the patients uh, with the ARDS, acute lung injury because of the profound hypoxia and hypoxia induced pulmonary vessel constriction, uh, venous thromboembolism, acute and chronic. Uh, the similar thing happening uh, with the uh, in patients who already have got uh, uh, cardiorespiratory uh, problems like COPD, restrictive pulmonary heart disease, and again the chronic uh, pulmonary hypertension and uh, uh, causes. We divide into uh, primary pulmonary hypertension, diseases of the heart, like uh, valve, uh, valvular heart disease, uh, mitral stenosis, so uh, lung disease, uh, uh, obstructive or restrictive lung diseases, uh, chronic uh, venous thrombolism, and, uh, and the miscellaneous condition that all can cause uh, pulmonary hypertension. And this is a sort of classic classification of the pulmonary hypertension which can be the question also for the DNB candidates. Uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. And once the catheter tip has reached the pulmonary artery, then it is advanced until it goes in the one of the branch of the pulmonary artery and we get the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. And, uh, uh, and when it is in the correct position, the balloon should be deflated. And when balloon, you deflate the balloon, the pulmonary artery trace comes. When you inflate the balloon, the pulmonary wedge pressure trace comes. Uh, and I'll show that in a minute. Hmm. Uh, so pulmonary uh, artery occlusion pressure is equal to pulmonary, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which also uh, equivalent to left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Uh, it is best uh, captured in the supine position at the end of expiration and in zone three. And normal uh, wedge pressures are about six to 15. And this is the waveform. Can somebody tell me where the, there will be high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and where will be the low? Just tell me the high first. So any of the DNB or fellowship candidates can answer and interact yeah. if yeah. they want. If you like, yeah. So uh, Dr. Saurabh has uh, uh, replied it is a left atrial myxoma. Yeah, or yeah. 
or mitral stenosis yes yeah mitral stenosis mitral regurgitation and uh, even uh, left ventricular uh, myocardial infarction yeah yeah cardiogenic That's shock good. yeah fantastic cardiogenic pulmonary edema is well. very good this is the ideal position what i was uh, describing briefly before that's the west uh, uh, zone 3 position where the pulmonary artery pressure is more than the pulmonary alveolar pressure which is less than the pulmonary venous pressure and that's the ideal position of the pa catheter this is the waveforms again and what i was describing when balloon is inflated you get this stress the waist stress balloon is deflated you get the pulmonary artery stress and uh, most of the causes uh, you uh, told here. So that's very good. Well done there. Uh, can't remember the name who told, but very well done. Okay. So uh, those conditions left to ventricular systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure, maternal and vertical disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypervolemia, large right to left churn, pericardial disease. These are the causes where the pulmonary capillary waste pressure will be high. And, and often it is low. Uh, two classic conditions, hypovolemia and the obstructive shock. Obstructive shock can be because of the pulmonary embolism or can be pericardial tamponade. Uh, and how it calculates the cardiac output with the thermodilution techniques, uh, with the uh, fixed uh, method, uh, which is uh, the, the, uh, the uptake of the oxygen dependent on the delivery of oxygen and the difference between arterial oxygen and the venous oxygen. And, uh, and uh, we get the measurement of the cardiac index. Uh, our 2.8 to 4.2 is normal mm, liters per minute per uh, meter square. And these are the classic uh, conditions where with the decrease cardiac output, systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure, this, this GNP candidates again, got to know this uh, and this is where we got to know how we are going to differentiate what are the causes when we get the information through the pa catheter how we are going to use in our clinical practice that is what mm, is important decreased cardiac output is in this, this heart failure systolic or diastolic maternal trigger hypovolemia pulmonary hypertension right ventricle failure cardiogenic shock obstructive shock increased cardiac output is the septic shock, but other conditions which also cause the, the increased cardiac uh, uh, output is sepsis, hepatic failure, AV fistula, pyrotoxicosis, anemia, very, very renal disease. Those are the conditions with the uh, increased cardiac output. Complications, uh, if you put more, there are less complications. Uh, just uh, uh, you get used to. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, most of the complications are exactly are the central venous line complications, bleeding, arterial puncture, air embolism, thoracic duct injury, pneumothorax, hemothorax, and the delayed complication with the infection and thrombosis. Uh, additional complication related to PA catheter are arrhythmias, uh, misplacement, knotting, uh, kinking and knotting of the catheter we have to, to watch. That's why uh, while insertion and removal, we have to be very careful. Valve rupture, especially we are pulling the catheter out with the balloon inflated. Uh, that's where it can cause the problem. Uh, and uh, pulmonary artery perforation for the similar reason, thromboembolism, infection, uh, uh, those are the uh, other complications. What is the evidence? And, uh, uh, and we have got uh, cell. Who is going to tell uh, quickly uh, the evidence? Uh, uh, but the uh, the, it is controversial. It is very controversial. There are not sort of enough trials and whatever the trials are done, they have not shown the mortality difference. Uh, whether the, the trials were conducted with the exact uh, correct aim is the question. And, and that's where we get controversial data uh, in spite of the lack of evidence. Uh, pulmonary artery catheter remains uh, quite common in the use uh, tool for the cardiac output monitoring. Uh, and uh, we'll go briefly for the other uh, cardiac output monitoring. Uh, and uh, uh, bef before that, uh, Sel, do you want to tell the evidence what why use the PE catheter? 
Sir, Dr. Narita has uh, put, a, uh, put a remark like uh, one of the trial, like Pacman trial. Yeah, that's what uh, I was waiting, Pacman. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in fact, that's what I, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, go, who wants to ask the question? Please go ahead with the question first. Gunadhar, what was the question? Hmm. So the Pacman trial, Dr. Narendra has put a uh, yeah. uh, mark that there is no evidence of PA catheter. Yeah. In the pandemic, I think in the most of the yeah. studies, what this was. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Sel, uh, do you want to answer? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, certainly no uh, randomized control trial so far has shown any mortality benefit from pulmonary artery catheter use. And certainly the Pac-Man trial didn't show any hospital mortality benefit. Uh, and this could be interpreted in, in, in different ways. Um, I think it can be interpreted that it can be used safely because it did not increase the mortality. Um, the Pac-Man trial Pac also showed that uh, the PAC, the, the pulmonary artery catheter, actually altered management within two hours um, of about 80% of the uh, patient's management actually. And this is uh, looking at um, titration of fluid or titration of um, vasoactive therapies. So my interpretation of this is uh, it does have the potential uh, to change management in sick patients, particularly in the early resuscitation phase. And perhaps mortality may not be the best outcome to judge the efficacy of a monitoring tool. Um, after all, it's, it's like an X-ray or uh, like culture results. It should be judged on its ability to provide information to the clinician uh, in order to individualize therapy uh, rather than uh, rather than uh, be judged on a mortality, uh, uh, which is probably better. Uh, used for um, judging the efficacy of therapeutics or drugs as opposed to a monitoring tool. Good, good discussion. And uh, 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 so, and, and this is uh, what classically will be asked even in the exam, how you would critically evaluate the role of the pulmonary artery catheter. So good uh, discussion on both sides. So fantastic. Uh, that's very good. And that's how the evidence is. It is controversial. Any other comments, anyone, before we go to the so, next one? Yeah. As far as the role of PA catheter is concerned, I mean, I think it is still validated and it is quite useful, provided that you know how to interpret the data that is associated with the um, uh, monitoring, basically. We should be able to uh, insert the catheter well and we should be able to interpret the data. If you are not able to interpret the data well and if you have not chosen the patient rightly, probably you may feel that it is useless but it is still a gold standard and i yeah, think it cannot, it cannot be replaced though it is invasive there are more non-invasive tools available but it is still a gold standard and probably it, it, it is one of the assets that we have in the armamentarium of hemodynamic monitoring absolutely that, that's a good comment uh, akhilesh and uh, uh, in fact uh, most of the other tools non-invasive tools or minimally invasive tools are compared with the PA catheter. So whether the, the other tools are good or not, they are judged depending on the cardiac output generated by the PA catheter. That was, that's why it is still considered, amongst the two, it is it, it's still considered as, as the gold standard. So can we just uh, have an opinion of other uh, panelists like Dr. Amol uh, and Dr. Pramod? So what is their take? Uh, so, do you still they use the PA catheter or they have uh, replaced the PA catheter with the recent uh, uh, cardiac output monitor like hemosphere? Yeah, uh, uh, Akhilesh, thanks for the question. And uh, Dr. Millen, thanks for the overview. Uh, as both of you pointed out, we, I, I would say that the trend has been in favor of PA catheter for last couple of years. So it, you know, it came as the 90s and then there is a lot of use and then suddenly it vanished between, I would say that 2010 to 2016, 17. And after the escape trial, which said that almost like 25, 30%. And that that's true in our unit too. So because what's happened over the course of last three, four years, and that is a, I, I'm not sure. So if you see that all the talk and all the literature and in, in particular to critical care uh, medicine, so there is a phase. 
something comes up everybody continue to use then there is a trial will, so that there is no value and then there is a group who will come promote the things is really great and then people will start using that so this is what is happening the pa catheter story so people are thinking that this is we are misutilizing or be less utilizing there is a value so the take home personally i feel that it does have a role however its role is it to be defined in a particular way so that's my take we do use at least two condition where like in our unit because we are heavy on transplant we are heavy on lvad as well as uh, rvad and ecmo so there is this populations for the transplant evaluation if i need to know where i need uh, for the before transplant yes we need to have a pa catheter similarly with the recent uh, change in the the opton which is the us version of the transplant for the cardiac transplantations and then the, the impella use now we are kind of in a uh, catch 22 situation that you have to have the cardiac index and then the impella numbers put it in the opton and then suddenly your patient's overall scoring system increases so that's there but the 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 personally if you ask me uh like where i do or use the pa catheter in the mic you or in the day to day practice so the simplest answer is when i'm completely lost that yeah. you know i cannot really decide whether this is cardiogenic or septic or i am already adding one after another uh, medications and then I, i i don't know where like it's like it's kind of i would say that i'm lost in the highway or maybe i ne- i i went to mumbai once I, and you cannot know where which gully you are going and then how to come out to the main street that's what kind of situation where i use the pa catheter to get the sense at least you can discontinue or discard some of the things which is not there and then focus on some of the things so that's what it is so i hope i i answer the questions what you yeah. all really wanted so yeah dr amun what is your take you yeah so no uh, see i, I uh, work in a onco unit we don't have a cardiac uh, patients so i i, I hearing all from all the speakers and panelists having extensive experience of cardiac cases so for us actually uh, frankly we are not used pa catheters for long, many years we what, what we normally use are uh, means of cardiac output monitoring using either a uh, uh, flow track pico or volume view and uh, frankly uh, at least for us we have not found any uh, significant role of uh, using pa catheters in outside of cardiac uh, icus yeah dr aditi what is your experience and your take and dr niranjan yes so hi so uh, like you know gunadhar you and i work in uh, in a cardiac in a cv unit so we use a lot of pa catheters as well uh, for our patients uh, we've not really had much trouble yes i agree that uh, like an x-ray doesn't have mortality benefit but more information is always uh, you know power for an intensivist and the more uh, information we get from the pa catheter along with clinical data definitely helps us treat our patients and i think it is a a good tool to have yeah dr niranjan because you are yeah, uh, working yeah hi it. yeah yeah uh, thank you dr uh, milen uh, dr guru for uh, uh, sharing so much information so i work in uh, one of the multi specialty hospital we have a uh, big cardiothoracic unit and uh, i specifically work in medical icu yes we do use pa catheter uh, kind of regularly in post operative patients and specifically heart and lung transplant patients specifically they use uh, coming to critical care uh, specifically non cardiac critical care patients when we see uh, we have not uh, we have stopped using uh, to be very precise i have seen uh, pa catheter some near about some 8 uh, year back once i was working in gongaram hospital they were using in uh, medical issues but uh, it's a kind of stopped now yes it might be bias or uh, might be the because of lack of uh, the trials uh, coming with positive result in critically sick patients and probably uh, other 
minimal in invasive or maybe less invasive techniques are available so medically or critical icu uh, I, I i my decision will be tilted towards minimal invasive or non invasive but yes in cardiac or cardiothoracic icu we do use regularly the pa catheter thank you so uh, i just have one uh, what to say basically whatever the cardiac output monitor you have devised basically the bias and the accuracy has been compared to the standard uh, gold standard uh, this uh, cardiac output monitoring by the pa catheter so i think it is one of the good modality probably once one know how to use it and in what circumstances and what situation it has to be used yeah thank you so dr milan we can proceed sir yeah uh, good comments uh, from all the panelists fantastic uh, vishy are you there do you want to comment anything he is one of my colleague uh, yes milan Go ahead. Uh, look, actually, uh, it's a wonderful. I think um, um, many of the panelists and the uh, uh, senior clinicians have given opinion. So my take will be the PA catheter currently across the evidence, if you see, they are being used in cardiothoracic surgery related stuff, and in medical non-cardiac surgery patients, usually it has not shown any benefit. But however, to guide the therapy, it is commonly used. Many times we need. especially if the patient is having pulmonary hypertension patient is having cardiogenic shock you want to titrate the therapy i think i would use the pa catheter that is one but units uh, some of the units they you prefer other devices like pico catheter flotac catheter and all that that is also fine but pa catheter has got distinct advantage of therapies because it gives pulmonary occlusion pressures and all that um so it has got still a role Uh, even in non-cardiac surgery patients, um, and it will be used. And every uh, in, uh, trainee should know how to interpret, how to use. The more you interpret, the better. I think you will be enjoying it more and using it more. If you don't interpret it, then you feel it it is useless. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, good comments. Uh, so we'll we'll proceed now. So another uh, thing, uh, what I use is the Pico, and I use Pico as well plenty. As I said before, uh, mostly uh, every person, every patient who, who with the, who is on uh, who is shocked, who is on noradrenaline, about twenty or twenty is sort of my threshold to get the cardiac output monitoring, either some or other technique, either the PA catheter or the Pico, and uh, I I have uh, plenty of Pico as well. Uh, particularly uh, uh, sort of uh, if there are junior registrars around and uh, not enough experience to put the uh, pa catheter uh, then we we'll go ahead with the pico uh, for timing and then get the pa catheter done first thing in the morning uh, and uh, so again most of the indications are shock patients sepsis trauma uh, pulmonary edema uh, acute lung injury ards burns uh, and uh, Uh, a, any condition that requires assessment of hemodynamic and volumetric function, we can consider the PA catheter. What it requires is only the central line, which most of the patients will have, and the the pico line, which is the the arterial line, uh, basically the long arterial line, which can go in any of the axillary, brachial, femoral, uh, the or the long catheter in the radial. I use only in the brachial or the femoral. Only those two arterial lines I, I use. Those uh, when I am putting the pico catheter, and uh, uh, so it has thermistor tipped uh, uh, line and uh, CVC line. And, and look at this; it, it uh, correlates strongly with the pulmonary artery flow catheter reading. So it has compared with the PA catheter uh, and standardized. And uh, and uh, cardiac output what we get uh, is uh, more or less uh, same uh, with the pico. now uh, i'll show what we get through the pico and what we don't get with that okay uh, compared to pa catheter as well and uh, it uses uh, uh, two physical principles one is transpulmonary thermodilution and the pulse contour uh, analysis uh, i uh, will just uh, i'm very mindful of the time as well we are already 49 minutes uh, and uh, Uh, what uh, it gives idea about the free load uh, which shows the global end diastolic volume intrathoracic blood volume of the four chambers 
plus the pulmonary vessels, stroke volume. So it gives idea about the preload. It gives idea about the contractility, which gives the, the information of the cardiac function index and, and uh, global ejection fraction. It gives the idea about the lung functions in terms of the pulmonary edema, uh, pulmonary vascular permeability index, and, and extravascular lung water. So for the lungs, and, and it gives idea about the upload, systemic, value, uh, systemic vascular resistance. So it gives reasonable data. Uh, what it doesn't give idea about the right heart. It doesn't tell us any information about the right heart. It gives a good idea about the left side of the heart, the, uh, the, the contractility, preload, afterload, and uh, not much information of, uh, on the pulmonary pressures. Uh, and many of the critical patients uh, have uh, the right heart uh, uh, issues and, uh, and the pulmonary uh, hypertension as well. LIRCO uh, is another device. Uh, uh, I must say I don't use that and it requires the similar uh, arterial line uh, plus the, or minus the central line. And uh, again, reasonable good calibration with the PA catheter. Uh, and, uh, uh, the, but the limitations are uh, the, the, there is no optimal signal uh, in arrhythmias, uh, patients who have the balloon pump, severe aortic rigor, uh, or uh, if the change in the system vascular resistance, that's the limitations. Flow track also came in the middle. Uh, as uh, Dr. Guru commented, uh, two techniques became popular uh, in last decade. They came for some time and went away uh, and uh, uh, less in with you. And, uh, but mm, the cardiac output is, is underestimated compared to the PA catheter. So it has uh, gone out of uh, favor. Uh, esophageal Doppler is uh, another one which uh, can be used uh, for the continuous real-time monitoring and the, uh, 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 the, the, the shift in the frequency of the reflected sound uh, can be seen and uh, wave changes proportionally with the change in the velocity. Obviously, there are some assumptions uh, in that, and uh, well, the assumptions are 70% of the blood enters through the descending avatar, and the blood flow is uniform uh, and maximum, and, and the cross-section is, is, uh, is constant, which uh, probably uh, every, every assumption may not be right for the critically ill patients. Uh, and uh, you, again, you can get reasonable information about the, the left heart, not on the right side, uh, and can't put uh, uh, the esophageal Doppler with the patients with the esophageal uh, the comorbidities like where I say or uh, esophageal pathology, patients who have the balloon pump or the severe coactation mm, as well. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and again, uh, the patient has to be uh, intubated, uh, probe has to be very close to avatar. Uh, it depends on the operator. Uh, there is a significant learning uh, as well. So there are a lot of limitations for this. Now, a lot of there, there are a lot of cardi uh, colleagues uh, who work in cardiothoracic center. I, I think uh, so. Uh, Francis Echo also is coming, particularly in the cardi cardiac and cardiothoracic surgery. And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and so, some of you who work more in the cardiothoracic center uh, would be able to comment more. So transesophageal echo, a lot of cardiac anesthetics use actually during uh, uh, the, the cardiac surgery and uh, advantages are uh, transducer is two to three millimeter from the heart, heart high resolution images. And so quality of images, what we get is very good. And, uh, uh, and that's why we can visualize left atrial, mitral valve, left ventricular, uh, pulmonary valve and aorta quite well and it's quite away from the, the surgical field, so it doesn't interfere with that. Uh, disadvantages are uh, injury to the uh, esophagus, uh, perforation of the esophagus, and needs special setup, uh, and, and needs expertise. Uh, and uh, uh, those are the complications, uh, particularly injuries to the esophagus. Rarely, if somebody shoving in, the splenic injury can happen as well. Uh, and uh, uh, are there many who use the uh, is esophageal uh, transesophageal echo? Hmm. 
amongst the panelists. Uh, yeah, I think Dr. Rahul wants to speak. Yeah, Dr. Rahul. So, so I think, sir, we can just finish up the talk and then uh, take okay. up the yeah. questions. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, it's almost finished, uh, actually. So other methods, uh, Vigilio came. I have used Vigilio. Uh, it came about five, seven years back, five to seven years back. And Dr. Guru said few few things came, went back like those. Vigilio came and disappeared in a couple of years, actually. And uh, uh, it, it was just the artery line, what is required to get the cardiac output. And I think company stopped using that. And uh, uh, Edwards, uh, I think they were the one. And they only have, in, uh, again, started with the EV1000. And uh, again, only requires uh, artery line. Uh, and uh, vigilance, uh, more or less the same. Again, uh, very minimally in, invasive. Hemosphere, they just use the, the, the fingers, the tip, uh, uh, and uh, uh, similar sterling system uh, to, to determine the, the edema. I don't use any of those. As I said, I have used Vigilio, and after that, I have not used the, the, the EV1000. Uh, so, but those are uh, in the market uh, uh, available. Uh, none of them is perfect. Each has its uh, own advantages uh, and disadvantages. and uh, uh, we need to decide what tool is uh, is useful for which patient and what we are going to use. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I might uh, stop. Uh, I would like to say thank you uh, before I open topic uh, to everyone. Uh, this is the South Australia. This is the wonderful city of Adelaide. And, uh, and uh, this is the outskirt of the Adelaide. Uh, uh, it's a handoff. Uh, it's a German village. Uh, uh, I just went for the lunch uh, last week there. It's uh, looking pretty because we are in the autumn at the moment. And, uh, and this is the beautiful Kangaroo Island. Uh, so I'd like to take opportunity to, to invite you and welcome to all of you to, to South Australia at some stage. Thank you. Topic is open for the discussion. Yeah, thank you, sir. So basically, after this uh, discussion of 10 15 minutes, so I think, uh, sir, I, again, there is a small uh, 10 minutes of uh, yeah. talk, mm. how to reach Australia, and I think uh, how to practice in Australia. So that is what uh, Dr. Milin is going to tell us. And before that, I think let's pick up some of the, some of the questions. So the, the, the first thing is uh, regarding the PICO. So I want to uh, ask everybody's opinion, like uh, Dr. Pramod, uh, Dr. Amol. So still PICO are being used in your units? Amal, go ahead. So we often use uh, PICO or volume view in our unit, but not for all patients, only for the patients who are not uh, managed. So it's like a third, last tier of our immunologic monitor. So all patients in ICU who are on vasopressors, they have arterial line. And then afterwards, if you have, the patient cannot be managed with uh, initial only arterial line and uh, resuscitation, they need vasopressors. The, the high vasopressors, then we choose between either a flow track or a PICO. And someone you know, who has a bad lung, so we have, we have less margin of safety for giving fluid boluses. We prefer to use PICO or volume view, which gives us additional information of extravascular lung water and which helps us in uh, yeah. deciding between the fluid and both the benefits and risk of fluid boluses. Yeah, yeah Dr. Pramod. Yeah, I, I think I, I completely uh, agree with Amol what he said. The practice is exactly similar here. We still use the flow track uh, in our unit on both uh, the medical as well as surgical side. Uh, and, and to be honest, again, <laughs> I, I might be sounds funny and I hope there is uh, no surgeons or I'm not uh, disregarding anyone's uh, expertise or everything. So I feel, you know, each physicians or surgeons have their love for one versus other kind of device. Yes. And then they, that love is like, it's just so uh, like unique love. They don't want it to go away. Even if you keep bombarding them that this is not, but they'll come back there. I don't want it to listen. Why don't you just put that? So in that case, you know, you are, you don't have any choice. And then I believe 
all of the intensives even we don't have any choice because we are the people who kind of uh, keep everybody's happy and as well as do our things to keep the patients happy and the family happy so in this midst of happy keeping happy everyone so we choose one versus other i'm not sure what is right but for the intensivist as well as medical practice you know you will see that uh, depending upon what phase of the uh, cardiac monitoring or what things there are all these things uh, involved so that's the so called philosophical and practical aspect of the care and then if you think about the real physiological and where you need to do that yes you know if you are really struggling with a pa catheter or you already have the pa catheter and then it developed complication i i'm not sure like i i just wanted to hear from other people uh, what is the complication rate so personally i have seen that even if people claim that it's less than 1 to 2% 3% of complication rate it is pa catheter is not that simple you know and there are situation where you know if the pa catheter inflated and bleed the only place the patient can be salvaged is the or and it's with the middle of the night forget about it you know so i have seen this kind of things like if you see once you'll never forget that you know it's not just simple it's mm -hmm. not floating it's not simple and then the same is that you know if there is a torrential tr or mr or you know like a, a congenital abnormality of your heart or they have already previous surgery or they have two or three leads on the like more and more we are getting people with many you know uh, like uh, pacemaker and all so it's very difficult to float and then we we are at least in our unit we are utilizing the uh, the the bedside fluoro to float it it's difficult so the bottom line is to shut the answer yes we use but it varies uh, it's not a routine phenomena to be honest yeah what about dr aditi what is uh, your take on uh, this uh, all this uh, volumetric based uh, cardiac output monitoring like pico and volume view and with comparison to echo um the advantage that uh, pico and flow track have over echo is that it's a continuous monitoring with echocardiography we can uh, we can definitely measure the cardiac output but we won't get and look at the right heart as well as the left heart however uh, it is difficult to get continuous values with echocardiography another thing with echocardiography is it's very um, dependent on the person doing the echo and their skills to get the right images uh, things like you know right the right angle at which you're measuring it if it's more than 20 degrees you can get wrong values if you're measuring uh, the vti is in the right uh, you know at the right position with the closure click and not the opening click that is important uh where you're measuring the diameter of the lvot is important so these things are very prone to mistakes uh by the same observer or various different observers so that's the limitation for echo otherwise echo is easy absolutely non invasive and uh good to do and it gives us information of both sides of the heart as well it does definitely have these limitations uh pico and flow track uh are more continuous forms of uh, information and we do use them in our transplant patients as well in our unit as you know and uh, again uh, like it was recently it just said that it depends on the comfort of the operator of the intensivist using it and how good they are at interpreting the results i think that is what ultimately should matter there's no sense in having a device and the icu team the nurses the doctors not knowing how to interpret the values Right. So, Doctor Niranjan, I think uh, your your center has uh, many number of ECMO cases. So, if a patient is on ECMO, what kind of cardiac output monitor do you choose? ECMO with IBP and other uh, extracorporeal therapies. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, before the, before answering uh, hemodynamic monitoring in ECMO patients, I would like to uh, add a little bit. In our center uh, for non-ECMO patients, specifically critically sick patients. so yes of course we know uh, the visilio system once upon a time we are using so frequently we are not using that frequently but the volume view we are still using though it's based on the same principle again and the policy is around 30 to 40% uh, time the policy can come but sometimes we uh, we use the combined like the 2d echo as well as the volume view specifically uh, 
so the stroke volume of course it can underestimate but probably the volume variation once the patient is paralyzed put on adequate volume tidal volume uh, so sometimes it's a dependable variable variable so that we have seen and coming to 2d eco parameter specifically yeah uh, yes it is uh, user dependent but the uh, learning curve is very stiff it's it doesn't take much time specifically even in, even with the newer trainees within one to two months we can train them so uh, i don't ask my trainee to see the complete heart or the ejection fraction even simply i train them to check the five chamber view, view to focus on the either before or the after the avt wall if they are putting on the lvot they can measure the lvot vti and it might be 15 15 degree 20 degree or 25 degree also now i ask them to see the leg raising pre leg raising and post leg raising in same position the vti either it's a out flow vti or it's a lvot vti so once they keep the position same that gives us a reasonably acceptable idea about the uh, uh, the cardiac output incre increment as for the leg raising so kind of we have standardized that in our unit but it's again it's not a single parameter i have made like even my uh, my resident if they are in the night duty they are clueless what to do i simply ask okay you check the vti sometimes if they are senior they will tell me everything okay uh, the lvot diameter vti they will tell me the output everything but at least minimum they will check the uh, vti pre plr post plr vti they will tell vti is less than 15 less than uh, 10 easily you can go and give fluid if it is more than 25 of course there is no point uh, so that that's the kind of standardization we have made we are more depending upon the echo though it's user dependent so that that's the thing now coming to the ECMO patients specifically, yes, if a patient is on VA ECMO, again, it's a it's a it's a big puzzle. Okay, what we are going to use. So now there will be differential pressure in the upper limb versus the lower limb. If we are cannulating the vein again, CBP is gone, right atrial pressures are gone, PA catheter rarely we use with the VA ECMO. So we uh, dependent depend on the radial arterial pulsation and specifically we use uh, volume view parameters when we use yes. for VA, VA ECMO. VV ECMO is a same as other non-ECMO patients, so that's not a problem, but uh, VA ECMO specifically we use the volume view, uh, but I would like to know from other panelists, uh, like what kind of parameters specifically Dr. Guru and other people, of course in Australia they will be using uh, many other, uh, specifically in VA patients. I think Dr. Guru can answer because he's uh, done in many number of ECMO cases. Yeah, th thank you, Niranjan, and thanks, uh, Guna, for the uh, questions too. As he pointed out, so if you ask me one thing to remember that there is no, I, I would say that the numbers you get with a PA catheter in ECMO patient has no meaning at all, period, because it's completely screwed up with the differential flow in the two, two system. So you cannot interpret that. So, and, and, and in the same way, so the, the number or the, the specific number we always think about uh, for a normal or standard patient with the PA catheter doesn't apply to ECMO patients. So it has no meaning. So in the absence of that, I don't really, you know, if there is a catheter, I'm fine. I don't use at all. I don't promote using, rather the specific things in particularly if you are in the VA ECMO patient, as Niranjan pointed out, that if the VA ECMO patients, two things you need to know, whether the aortic valve is opening or not, and what is the your pulse pressure? Like, is it how, how you are monitoring that? So for that, you know, if you have a, Atrial line and then echocardiogram or like the TE or transthoracic, depending on which situation, that's well enough. So that's what the uh, the prevalent practice in our center, uh, to be honest. Actually, uh, we are also doing uh, this uh, transplant programs, cardiac transplant program. So uh, in most of our cardiac transplant or heart transplant patient. We are uh, now started using the hemosphere because the Edward Life Science, I think the Dizilio monitor and the, uh, yeah. the CP1000 is now going out of date. 
and uh, they have come with this newer monitoring uh, devices that is the hemosphere monitoring where you can get the pulmonary vascular resistance so this is uh, I, we found this to be a very good monitor and uh, almost uh, means uh, most of the hemodynamic parameters uh, you can obtain easily and uh, smoothly so you have any experience on that the hemosphere the recent generation monitor yeah we you know again uh, we have the edward hemos like edwards uh, hemosphere we do have so yes you know at the end of the day when you are in this complex uh, patient scenario like for example all the people under your transplant unit or the ecmo unit so uh, the 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 mind need peace in order to have the piece, you need the number because if you don't read the number, then the, then you are always in TZ. And then the same is false also for the other people, those who are at the bedside in the nursing, the, uh, the everybody wants to have a number in that because that's fixated and then they wanted to have it. And we all need that kind of thing. So, but the take home message, I always say that if I, I don't want a single number, I want the number in a, in a so, so trends as well as what are the other scenarios? So the most and the best person or best scenario which can teach you is the patient's overall clinical condition. Where you stand four hours back, where you stand right now. If, because the reason I'm saying is that if you put a PA catheter or with this, the, there will be always a number. What to do with the number is God knows because there will be some abnormal numbers all the time. Do you really want it to address that abnormal number or, or, or just see the uh, global picture of the patients that, you know, they, yes, I was four hours back when the patients come from the uh, OR, these are the things I came across. Now with the interventions, I'm kind of comfortable and then we'll see what's happening. So just chasing the number that doesn't help, but having a number trend does help. So that's what it is like, you know, there is a, not a fixed parameter to really follow. You follow what is appropriate according to the patient just in front of you. And then the device you use, what is the limitation of your device and what is the limitation of your overall patient condition? That's what will give you the, the best picture. So, Akhle, sir, what is your well, wonderful. I have one question uh, to all the panelists. I mean, we are uh, moving from... Uh, invasive to non-invasive and uh, pulmonary artery cathetering selected group of patient is quite vital. If you have good understanding of uh, the parameters that are to be, you know, elicited. So uh, I would like to uh, ask the panelists whether uh, the non-invasive tools are equally effective like newer techniques, bioimpedance and bioreactants uh, have been well validated and a lot of studies are there and it has been non I would like to know from uh, the panelists whether uh, you would uh, you know, agree with uh, these new devices to be a good additional tool or uh, should we completely rely on the existing tools. I know the innovations are always better for the betterment of the patient's outcome as well. So I would like to know from you all whether you are all using bioimpedance and bioreactance as a tool for cardiac output monitoring. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Senap and Dr. Guru and Dr. Niranjan and Dr. Aditi, you all, please, one by one. Yeah, uh, look, uh, so now uh, I'll come to your question and somebody just comment, uh, asked there to comment on the pediatric as well, okay? So, a lot of those... Uh, so, yeah. uh, Dr. Sakuntala, she is my teacher. So, basically, she is a practicing cardiac anesthesiologist and science hospital. She is yeah. uh, the professor in charge. So, she wants to know the uh, good uh, cardiac output monitoring system for a pediatric uh, patient, particularly pediatric cardiac surgical patients. Yeah, yeah, sure. Look, uh, I don't have much experience of the pediatric, I must say. Uh, so, uh, I have, uh, and, and the newer tools also, we don't use the newer tools. But what I would say is the, 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 the data, most of, most of them, uh, is, is still not completely validated. Whatever the the medical rep, they, they come up with uh, very small uh, papers and no, number of patients. What we have not discussed and what I use, one more thing uh, quite often, is the central venous oxygen saturation. Most of the people uh, uh, who have the central line, and I, I use their central venous uh, uh, gas uh, every four hourly. And that also gives a, the quite good trend what the central venous oxygen saturation is. And, and the, 
the determinants of the central venous uh, saturation is one of the, the most important determinant is the cardiac output along with the VO2, VO2 ratio. And, uh, uh, and if, if we have the oxygenation is good, delivery of the oxygenation, if the hemoglobin is optimized, there is no hypoxia, then almost it gives direct uh, indicator of uh, the, the cardiac output. So if, if, uh, if, I, uh, so if I don't have the PA catheter, it's a night time, we don't have time to go, uh, their junior registers or PA, uh, PICO is not, not used. I just tell them to, to do the serial central venous oxygen saturation. And probably I would use that. And that is something it's, I find very, very useful uh, in the clinical practice as well. And it is often under, under utilize underestimated and uh, so we and there is a central line so why don't we just use that you know so this is what uh, I, I would say hmm. and uh, i think the answer to dr Achille's question the yeah. uh, uh, as as dr sanap has raised the issue like central venous oxygen saturation is a good surrogate marker of uh, uh, tissue perfusion and probably the indirect marker of cardiac output monitoring and it is quite uh, you know, equivalent to a mixed venous oxygen saturation with a difference of around 5 to 10 uh, of that. But, you know, I think we also should have an understanding that mixed venous oxygen saturation gives you uh, the perfusion of the whole body, upper part of the body and lower part of the body. Whereas uh, uh, central venous oxygen saturation will give us the idea of uh, perfusion of upper part of the body. So, but do you still agree? I mean, you know, if I have a patient who is having wound in the lower limb and lower uh, part of the body is affected and the, the perfusion is compromised. In that situation also, would you be completely relying on SCVO2 or would you use other surrogate markers? I mean, uh, this is... Yeah, no, no, the, not, not completely. Uh, if yeah. I have the yeah. other tool, definitely I would yeah. go for the other tool, you know? Yeah. But many times what happens, the, the pulmonary artery catheter is not the resuscitation line. It's always, uh, it comes later. The resuscitation line is the cannula and the central venous line, you know? And then you put those lines, start the resuscitation of the patient, go and have a cup of coffee, come back, and then decide the PA catheter uh, insertion. Check the coagulopathy, check there is no contraindication. So it never goes in, in that rush, the, how the center line goes in. So meantime, till the time I have got other uh, tool available, I will definitely use the center line. Mm. And uh, yeah. the here is the trend of probably SCVO2. Yeah, yeah, is also very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. And about yeah, bioreactance I, and uh, yeah, bioimpedance technique. I, I can come. So I, sorry, Melin, you want to? No, no, I haven't. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll just come in two things about like you know, uh, like uh, what both Melin and Oculus pointed out that, so, uh, and what we are discussing here. Uh, it's not just a single number, you know, in, in the absence, if you have everything, so use everything and correlate. If you do not have everything, then just use whatever available and easily available and then go back to, so I always teach my resident fellows as well as my colleague and then everything's that, you know, uh, always go back to the patients whenever you have a number. So don't, mm. don't treat your uh, computer because you got a computer and then you got a number just, just don't go to that. So go to the patient and find out where you stand and then come back. So there is a role of SBO2 for sure. There is a role of PA catheter numbers for sure. There is no question about that. To answer your call, bioimpedance as well as uh, spectrospirometry right now, they are not for the prime time because that's not being validated with significant number of people with a patient-specific outcome improvement. So that much more needs to be done. There is like... I do have a personal experience with the uh, uh, utilization of bioimpedance when back in like 20 years back when I was in, in, in PGI Chandigarh, uh, a group of uh, 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 hemodialysis patients to see what's their volume status. You know, it's a good core, AOC carb, like my senior who did it, this is the AOC carb is 0 0.6, 0 0.7. It's a pretty good, buffer, but it's not, it's not prime time yet that's number one number two there is things like the oral spectro microscopy like diffusion that's a pretty nice thing so when i was uh, in training in rochester we did have the uh, uh, microscopic uh, uh, scenario you put the patient and then you see the, how the uh, the 
the cells move through the uh, vessels in the oral mucosa as well as tongue. That's pretty nice, but you know, it's still in very primitive phase. It's not prime time, uh, but the future seems to be kind of more promising, uh, including all of these things. And then like I saw one message in the chat about the role of uh, uh, echocardiogram and everything at this, this era, you know. A, there is a school of thoughts and even the, the entire, uh, entire institution across the United States, at least uh, in the sense that we should throw the stethoscope and buy a pocket uh, iPhone as well as uh, echocardiogram for all the medical students mm -hmm. as well as practicing physician. That's what the future is probably because, you know, it, it's just, you don't need to be an expert on capturing the things. You just need a one shot like picture a good window to do that even I, I i'm not bragging you know like there is the NEGM paper uh, for us we say that how do you capture the uh, image uh, through the uh, uh, the echocardiogram so you just need to that like teach them what's there the basics can be like whether the heart is functioning well or the heart is not functioning well. Is there any pericardial effusion or no pericardial effusion? You the half of the cardiogenic shock is in your hand right away. And then you, you go move where you wanted to. And then also teach them that, like I, I, I wanted to like discuss and get the other panelists' opinion. You think about that. The PA catheter give you a static measurement. If it's not a dynamic measurement, what you give the PA pulmonary capillary waste pressure doesn't really predict the fluid things. So what is happening over the last three, four years, people are jumping to the PA catheter and giving the fluid as per the PA catheter value, but that's not the way you should use it. So it will give some numbers, please like integrate all the patient's clinical status before you intervene anything. That's my take home. Yeah, and uh, most of these volumetric based uh, cardiac output monitors like uh, the transformer dilution technique like PICO or volume view, they have a high chances of errors because uh, and when the when there is a right heart failure or there is a right heart dysfunction, I think you cannot completely rely on them and the biases are many. So that is why it has to be an integrated technique like uh, along with echo, you have to interpret it along with some form of non-invasive or minimally invasive, particularly the minimally invasive cardiac output monitor like the flow track, you have to see the train. I think that is the message you want to convey, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think we should not uh, just be completely, you know, reliant on the existing uh, newer advanced monitors, but we should not forget our clinical tools, your laboratory parameters, lactate is also still a good marker of uh, perfusion probably. And uh, yeah, and then SCVO2, as Dr. Sanup has rightly said, and I think there is one more uh, monitor. I mean, if we can use PCO2 gap, can also be an additional tool to you know help you with the perfusion and cardiac output monitoring. And then these uh, non-invasive techniques like uh, ultrasound and cardiac output monitors like 2D Eco and uh, flow track, these are all additional tools. They can be used together to get the complete picture of the patient. We can't be completely relying on one tool. I have one question. Are, are we using PCO2 gap as a monitor for uh, patients? Uh, adequacy of perfusion and cardiac output monitor. I think Dr. Amol uh, must be uh, doing it. Uh, one of the delegates has asked this question, are we still monitoring PCO2 gap as uh, a surrogate marker of cardiac output and perfusion? Over to you, Dr. Amol. Yeah, so we use PCO2 gap uh, frequently. No, I would not say frequently, uh, sometimes. Uh, mainly, so or may, uh, mainly uh, we, for resuscitation, we're using uh, uh, assessment of flu uh, response to, uh, to the fluid bolus we check and the PCU2 gap or lactate, uh, SCU2, all these are down, downstream parameters that we're using for uh, adequacy of cardiac output because just having a, one number of cardiac output is not going to make any sense. Yeah, we need to correlate it biochemically. So obviously one of them is PCU2 gap, other is SCU2 and uh, lactate. Yeah, so Dr. Deepak from Swarna Deepak from Hyderabad, Apollo, he has also uh, rightly put in the chat box that the serial lactate measurement and the capillary refill time is one of the important uh, surrogate marker of the good cardiac output. And this is one of the trial called Andromeda shock trial, which has also proven that. So he most of the times he is uh, using this and uh, I think the results are quite reliable. Yeah, 
so capillary refill time looks very interesting but you need to train your nurses to how to do it it's mm. not a very easy thing to it's no it, it is easier said than done i would say like lactate measurement any technician can do or even pcut cap anyone can do so if you are relying on crt for your resuscitation you need to be very sure what you are doing so there is subject to variability to it Absolutely. lot of subject to it regarding lactate and pco2 gap once upon a time uh, we were uh, depending but uh, those are uh, like uh, add on values so particularly in medical issues uh, there might be so many other reasons apart from hypoperfusion lactate the cause behind the lactate increase yes of course in trauma hypovolemic patients hypo uh, particularly upper gi bleed patients uh, lactate is definitely dependable uh, parameter and pco2 gap uh, we really don't use in our uh, unit and other units i know they were using the pco2 gap as a marker uh, those things should be used in combination with uh, like at minimally invasive or the uh, non invasive cardiac out output parameter as the surrogate markers definitely yeah. and uh, I, I yeah please please yeah go ahead so i'll just add to since like uh, to the uh, crt as well as lactate monitoring so uh, one thing i can tell you that because i am i'm always pulled into this ecmo business so i do monitor the serial lactate and i am really really uh, fixated on the serial lactate if i particularly instituted ba ecmo in a patient whether peripheral or central ba ecmo and the lactate is high and i have a good flow and the lactate is not clearing you have to scratch your head all the time there is something is missing so the lactate is very important for me in the initial 24 to 48 hour period in that group of patient i i i always wanted if their lactate is not clearing you have good flow that is something wrong so be careful about that yeah. that is the other thing it is about the uh, capillary refill time so according to the andromed trial so it's a fantastic trial and then the the entire group needs to be congratulated what they do it but in the same way as melin pointed out and then amol and other pointed out that you need to really train and then have a objective measure of the uh, how you measure how we interpret because if you cannot it's always wrong so then then you you are lost but yes at the bedside it's a very very useful tool initial in evaluation because obviously if you have a picture of your forest car cold kami or uh, dry uh, hot then that's 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 what it is i would like to uh, hear from dr aditi she is working in a cardiac unit so what is the best cardiac output monitor in probably in the operating room so if uh, she can comment because most of the monitors they don't work when the chest is open so what type of uh, monitoring system uh, the your uh, means our uh, this surgeons they use usually which is reliable our surgeons mainly go for uh, pa catheters uh, from what i have seen and the uh, the chest is open again i'm not an anesthetist i'm internal medicine background so i'm sure my anesthetist colleagues may be able to shed more light on this but since i have the mic i just like to point a few things when it is i know a lot of uh, people are saying that we should replace the stethoscope with an echo monitor an echo probe yes it is a very interesting and i nobody in the world would be as happy as me if that happens but it is there is also learning curve with that and what i would like to also impress to the students is that even if it doesn't you have to look at not only the the image if your patient whose ejection fraction is 10% as in and is in shock doesn't mean that they wouldn't be fluid responsive especially if they had diarrhea or bleeding so uh, always dynamic measurements of fluid assessment would be better you know a lot of times if a, a novice doesn't would not be able to differentiate between a hepatic vein and an ivc or i have seen so many of our own residents not different be able to differentiate between an aorta and an ivc uh, so a lot of a pericardial epicardial fat and pericardial fluid so there is definitely a learning curve and in the wrong hands any of these machines can give us really wrong information especially in the middle of the night when we ourselves are not there to see the images so for all the seniors who ask for echocardiography uh, or any other uh, information i would encourage them to ask the juniors or their residents registrars to send images 
so that you can yourself assess whether the images, whether what they're doing is right. And again, uh, you know, a low cardiac output doesn't mean that they don't have other reasons of shock. A, a yeah. chronic heart failure patient can have various other reasons for shock. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Aditi, for the last sentence. Like that is very important and very mm -hmm. like uh, pertinent to pass the message to the trainee because, you know, I would say that, as you mentioned, there is, there is nothing called a single number for cardiac output or cardiac index. It varies from every person to every person and every different situation. Do not just focus on that 2.1 or maybe 5 liter, whatever you can say that. Then, if you, then you are done. The patient is done and you are done. But thank you for that. That's a nice take-home message. So probably the experience is much more important than the exposure. Yeah. So... And uh, one should have a high index of suspicion and a good clinical sense and have a good sense of interpretation and uh, have a good sense of uh, like this clinical acumen to interpret those results. Then only it will improve the patient outcome. Bedside Overall. clinical signs and symptoms uh, would never be replaced by no matter what technology comes in. They can always help us, but our, you know, going by the bedside, touching the patient, examining the patient can is always, always going to be our best tool as physicians for eternity. Dr. Jain, you will be making a lot of enemy outside as well as inside the, your hospital, I believe so. <laughs> so, uh, may I add one point about please, open please. chest? So, you please. said, what was the question about the open chest and cardiac yeah. output monitor? Yeah. So, most of the cardiac output monitor actually they don't work when the chest is open. Because, so because about the cardiac surgery or lung surgery? Cardiac surgery, cardiac surgery. Okay. I so, think transesophageal echocardiography can be a good tool to have a good assessment. Or right. like but you're, talk, you're talking about on bypass, right? Yeah, or either on the bypass or sometimes uh, uh, like the beating heart where the patient is not on the bypass, by, I mean by the bypass. Okay. So when the chest is open. So in those cases, I think the uh, transformer dilution technique uh, based cardiac output monitor. Uh, no, I don't see a reason why a transformer uh, uh, should not work. It should work. Only point is you don't have heart lung interactions the way you have in a closed chest. So what okay. your PPV, SVV, they are not going to be reliable. But yes. I don't see if there is integrity of circulation is intact. Let's say you are doing a, a bypass uh, uh, on off pump. I don't see any reason why your cardiac output, whether it's a, uh, your PAC or your flow track or your uh, volume view. I don't see a reason why it should not be reliable. Good, good comment. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically the thing is that in the trans thermodilation technique, so the thing is that when there is an increase in the pulmonary congestion or there is an increase in the circulation time or there is an increase in the hydrostatic pulmonary edema, yeah. those cases the fallacies and uh, the reliability is less. So in that case, we should not use an ARDS patients, right? Yeah, so that is at the most of the times uh, this uh, volumetric based uh, uh, echo ca your cardiac output monitoring don't work properly in the ARDS. So, I, I mean, probably they mean to say more about the PPV and SPV. Yes, than, yes, uh, yes. Like it, won't, uh, it won't be exactly correct, correct. but it's, 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 we never want a number. We want exactly. a trend. So yes. in that way, it will be still working. It will not be working to the optimal, but we can still extract the data. Mm -hmm. One more thing, yes, I want to add that is a difference between accuracy and precision. So, you know, it may not be accurate. So, if your real cardiac output is five liters, it may show either 4.5 or 5.5, but it will be consistently having the same error and it will be precise enough to give you a trend which you can help in titrating your therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, the trend is more important in, uh, I think, in such, such scenarios. Yeah, that, yeah. In that, in that way, in terms of speed assessment, when we calculate, when we go for the stroke volume variation, when you use the uh, visualio monitor, so it might underestimate the cardiac output. Yes, that's we agree. But uh, I agree with Doctor Amol. The same amount of error, it will make either end of inspiration or end of expression. So uh, the stroke volume variation might be a dependable entity. So even if it underestimates the stroke volume, uh, yeah. per se. So we, uh, so that's the reason sometimes we depend, particularly when very, very sick patients, specifically cardiogenic shock patients, when they land up in a, uh, some sepsis, when the, uh, it's like a mixed shock, when we are not sure it's a clear cardiogenic or a vasoplegic shock, uh, we use that parameter 
even the stroke uh, even the peripheral vascular resistance also we use uh, but again the dependency is is a questionable yeah and the same thing like the arterial uh, pressure or the pulse uh, the, the pico uh, your what is called the arterial pressure based monitoring like the flow track also also sometimes is uh, showing a false value when there is a shock is because it depends on the arterial nature of the pulse wave and the compliance of the system so when the compliance is not good like most of the cases where the svr goes down or there is a shock state most of the times you will get a, a falsely uh, wrong values in uh, this uh, flow track system and other cardiac output so you are right uh, well, absolutely the old generation flow tracks they are heavy they are having this problem they were not calibrated for septic patient but the all the generation 3 flow tracks they have been validated very well in the septic patients also and the accuracy is reasonably well i will not say it as accurate as pa catheter but a reasonable acceptable alternative to pa catheters or any other cardiac output mode correct so, okay, so uh, what, what, yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yeah okay. please, so what, uh, one point i like to add here so we have used thoracic bioimpedance uh, monitor in our unit that uh, that twin cardiothoracic unit and we tried to validate uh, with the pa catheter So, so our correlation was hardly it's uh, kind of sixty to sixty five percent. So, and the uh, it, it was kind of it's a, a little cumbersome to use in that cardiac arrest unit. Six leads that to in a patient who under already underwent the uh, surgery, there will be two uh, pipes drainage pipes. So that was little difficult. We used near about thirty five patients. The result was not that encouraging, but I would like to listen from other people if they have used and uh, if they have correlated with the PA catheter well used. No, we don't have any experience. We have any, not used. To be honest, no experience. Yeah, that's a demo machine. Uh, uh, long back in two thousand seventeen, eighteen, it came to India, but uh, nowadays I am not seeing any any center using it. also yes, yes. Uh, the presence of pleural effusions pericardial effusions or a lot of lung water like ards will affect our yeah. values theoretically mm-hmm. right so most of our icu patients don't have these issues so it limits the population in which it can be used anyways if i'm not wrong correct so uh, i think can we bring an end to the discussion and we have a important very interesting session of 10 to 15 minutes waiting for us uh, yeah i'll be quick for the yeah. next one already 97 minutes isn't it uh, yeah and uh, uh, so uh, thank you so I'll dr milin is going to uh, just uh, enlighten us and about the uh, practice of critical care for the indian intensivist in australia what is the scope and how one can uh, go there and practice intensive care medicine so mm, I, uh, as i talked uh, i'm supervisor trainee here for more than 15 years so i'll just briefly talk uh, i got plenty of trainees coming uh, every year actually in uh, uh, in my unit uh, we get at least uh, minimum 10 years no 10 trainees a year and uh, uh, and there are so many units uh, in in australia and so there is a huge scope uh, for uh, trainees uh, who want to come to australia from all of, all over the world mm. and uh, uh so uh, the 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 mm, the governance of the training uh, is done by the college of intensive care medicine uh, of australia and new zealand and uh, uh, and uh, all the units uh, uh, who are the training unit are attached to the college of intensive care uh, uh, medicine and unless and until that happens uh, that training is not recognized there there are some uh, hospitals some units uh, uh, they may not be attached to the college so they are not the training unit well well some units which are attached they are the training units that's a big difference between the two so uh, to become a trainee of the college what college expects uh, is the doctor will have the ability to achieve all the competencies and show all the values uh, attitudes and aptitudes required of a specialist in intensive care medicine uh, and then uh, the college allows each unit uh, to go through the trainee selection process and it's uh, is done uh, by the supervisor of trainee uh, and the colleagues uh, and uh, so the training time is uh, minimum 6 year uh, since 2014 the training has changed and and this is the, the the current training program which is the minimum of 6 years 
but often many trainees uh, take longer than that. Uh, about uh, eight, eight years uh, is uh, is quite quite common mm, because uh, is the foundation training, which is six months before they start the program. So they have to work somewhere. They work in ICU for six months, and then when two fellows of the college, two consultants, sign that this person is okay to enter in the training program, then only they can enter in the training program. And total training is uh, then after that, after that is, uh, is six years. So that involves uh, multiple aspects. Uh, so uh, the core training is the advanced training actually. So it, it has to be after the primary exam. I'll tell uh, in a minute what, what are the exams there. And the transition year has started, which is after passing the fellowship exam. Uh, and also training has to have one year of anesthesia, one year of general medicine uh, or, or medicine anywhere uh, in any subspecialty. Uh, electives, uh, six months, which can be uh, in intensive care or uh, somewhere else. Uh, then uh, trainees have to go in the rural area mm. for six months uh, and they need to have pediatric exposure at least for three months, uh, could be accrued up to six months. This is for the adult training. This is what is required. Uh, so, and that constitutes the total training time. Uh, uh, but also uh, when they are doing the training, they, they have to pass the primary exam before they start the, the core training of two years, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, uh, the transition year, uh, but other training they can do uh, before the, the first part of the exam. So they can do one year of anesthesia, one year of medicine, just the core ICU, uh, uh, what we call is the uh, basic training. Uh, and uh, once they pass the, the primary uh, exam, uh, or the first part exam, then start the advanced training. That's the core training. Uh, the CSM second part, also called as fellowship exam, that's the key exam in, in intensive care unit. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, trainees have to pass uh, that exam uh, to, to become the fellow. And uh, uh, this is considered as the tough exam for, by many people. Uh, and uh, uh, also the, all the trainees have to go to the training evaluation reports on the regular basis. They have to go through the workplace competency assessment, uh, observe clinical encounters. So. Nowadays, every three months, trainee has to present a case and uh, has to be up to the mark. Otherwise, their training uh, uh, is uh, not uh, accredited. The trainees who are before the 2014, they have to give at least four cases uh, before they appear for the uh, fellowship exam, which are satisfactory, uh, uh, considered satisfactory by the two fellows. Uh, project uh, are the, uh, also uh, uh, people call that thesis or dissertation. Uh, it's uh, the same thing, uh, the formal project. Those are the requirements uh, of the college. And at the, during the six years, you have to have all these courses ticked off. They have to do all these courses, brain death, organ donation, burns, uh, inhalation, injury, cultural awareness, evidence-based medicine, focus ultrasound. That's what uh, Dr. Guru was talking. Is the, is the focus, uh, what uh, they don't need to know everything, but the focus, the cardiac ultrasound, uh, neurointensive care, they have to go, uh, then uh, transportation of patient, spinal cord, neuro and spinal, uh, they have to do uh, airway workshop, communication courses, uh, and um, particularly breaking the bad news uh, to the uh, families, uh, echocardiogram, ultrasound, uh, and uh, introduction to intensive co uh, care course, management skill, management skill course has to be after passing the fellowship exam. Uh, donor awareness, probably it comes in the brain death only and uh, ALS uh, course. Uh, and uh, we, we probably we talked about that uh, here. Uh, so all those courses they have to do, uh, keep taking the courses as they go ahead. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and mm, sorry, uh, 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 so, um, and uh, uh, one more thing I should say is uh, when they are doing the training, uh, so training has to be in, in decided unit. So they can't do all the training in one unit unless that training, the training center 
is approved for all the six years of training. So some of the big centers are approved for all the uh, period of training, but many centers are not. So in so according to that, the the all the centers they are classified. Whether they are C6 unit, so or C12 unit or C24 unit, where they can do their core training of six months or 12 months or 24 months, and depending on that, uh, mm, uh, the units are classified. Uh, units are classified depending on their case mix, whether they have the trauma, whether they have got uh, uh, neuro, uh, they have the cardiac, uh, all those things decide uh, the, what type of the unit uh, it is. Uh, uh, and uh, ours is the C12 unit. And that means they can do uh, all of these medicine, anesthesia, uh, six months selective, and the core training of 12 months, uh, not of 24 months. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, the most important thing uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, the specialist international graduate. If somebody wants to come from overseas, if they have completed all the training, then uh, uh, so that involves uh, complete training in their own country and they're considered as a specialist in, in that country, uh, then they can apply uh, uh, for the recognition uh, of uh, their uh, their training, uh, and then the, uh, there are two parts. It, it goes to the Australian Medical Council, and then goes to the college. Uh, and uh, the Australian Medical Council assesses their uh, undergraduate qualification, and uh, the college uh, of intensive care medicine assesses their postgraduate qualification. And if they find the training, uh, whether it's uh, comparable and they divide it since it's a not comparable at all or whether partially comparable or a substantially comparable and then depending on that each case is assessed individually and and, uh, and depending on that the college uh, gives candidate report what how much training they need to do what training they need to do and where they need to do the training uh, uh, I also forgot to mention one thing, all the core training and transition year training is prospectively approved. So it can't be re retrospectively approved. Somebody can't do the training and then get approved. They have to get, get the prior approval before they uh, uh, start the training. Each six months, uh, they have to send that uh, uh, paperwork that that's what they are doing for next uh, the six months. Uh, so. And this is the, the pathway. There are huge opportunities for uh, the, uh, the trainees to come. Uh, there are uh, uh, people who come from all over the world, many countries, uh, India, uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Egypt, uh, England, uh, Canada, uh, America, almost everywhere, South Africa, uh, yeah, European countries. There are uh, many intensive care trainees and now uh, many specialists becoming uh, as well from almost every country. So it's a huge uh, 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 diversity uh, of the of the trainees and the specialists in, uh, and that's what makes uh, it Australian for, for, for those people. Uh, and, uh, and that's what I want to say here. If somebody wants to ask the question, uh, it's open for the discussion. Vishi is also there, one of my colleagues. Uh, he could also help uh, if the questions come. Yeah, so any, any trainee or fellows or uh, DMD, uh, exam going students, if they want to ask any questions, so we'll be happy to answer your queries. Just if somebody is uh, already, uh, you know, postgraduate and here in DND or DM critical care, from uh, Indian universities. So would it be still validated uh, by the Australian university or uh, would they get any exemption for uh, their training <clears throat> duration as far as uh, the further training in Australia is concerned? Uh, yes, uh, so there, there are two aspects. Uh, one is uh, what's, what's their goal? Uh, there is a short-term uh, goal uh, to come. 
it's called a short term training it's specially uh, designed by the college for the people who want to just visit for two years and then go back it's called a short term training program and then they don't mm, give any exam or, or, or become the specialist uh, in australia uh, so that's one way if they, they want to become the specialist then uh, probably this is the the pathway they have to get uh, their uh, degree assessed uh, by the college and yes i would imagine if they have done uh, prior uh, learning uh, college will substantially uh, approve their uh, prior learning and give uh, some of the exemption uh, i have never seen anyone who has got complete exemption they still have to do uh, some training but there are very very well people have got from uh, one year two years or uh, Mm, three four years are approved as well many people who, who what you are saying like dnb or dm who are the specialist uh, in those countries uh, i would say they would come mostly either the partial or substantially compatible uh, in the australian system okay uh, can i can i add uh, some more thing in case if somebody yeah. wants to enter apart from the college training uh, every candidate who wants to in, uh, practice in australia Uh, any speciality for that matter but especially icu you need to first have an english test done the english test to be currently valid that is within 2 years uh, with uh, with uh, depending upon the which english test ilts you are doing or some other test you are doing the amc will have its specific how much uh, uh, marks or score you should take that is compulsory the second is whether they should also sometimes it is better that they should do an uh, amc part 1 that is a mcq pattern because at doing a training and becoming an intensivist is one chapter but entry and getting a recognition for registration for apra apra is a body uh, like in the medical council uh, the apra is a body in australia which gives you registration to practice medicine without mm-hmm. that you cannot do any training so to practice that medicine you need at least some requirement that we have to follow that first so anybody who is thinking first ensure that you have got your english uh, is qualified uh, getting the appropriate scoring system uh, whichever the english you can do ilts or any other system there it is available on app apra website or australian medical council website it will be available and plus i would still prefer that it will be easier if you start doing the amc part 1 but it is not compulsory but it might be easier for you to get into the uh, if the and move into the australia once you do that process becomes much more easy otherwise there yeah. can be a lot of hurdles if uh, they have not passed the amc yeah i agree mm-hmm. okay so that's fantastic uh, uh, it, it would be uh, good to have a uh, uh, now uh, uh the training uh, program which is uh, uh quite substantial and very extensive early evaluating the candidates so it means you have to really prove yourself to be uh, a practicing intensivist over there so i think uh, it's a good choice uh, for the those who are interested to go to australia and start to practicing over there uh with this uh, i think uh, if there are no questions uh, can we wind up yeah. the session and yeah, uh, yeah. if, if uh, yeah. somebody uh, wants to some candidate wants to uh, uh, be in touch later also i'm in touch with dr gunadhar so feel free to contact uh, dr gunadhar and uh, he would be more than happy he's one of the colleague has uh, come here who is uh, training for our, uh, for our unit now uh, here uh, uh, in adelaide uh, yeah yeah Uh, Dr. Subhas. Subhas, I think Dr. Subhas was with us previously. Yeah. Yeah. I think he is now in Australia. Uh, and... Yeah, he is with us now. Oh. Yeah. Bye, Shorty. So I, I have put my email ID also here, so uh, they can be in touch with me or Dr. Akhilesh also. So thank you, uh, thank you for giving me opportunity uh, uh, to to uh, come and talk, and uh, I really appreciate. That's uh, wonderful. Uh, uh i have really enjoyed i have learned a lot uh, from all the panelists so uh, thank you i i must say thank you uh, dr milin sanab uh, you have been truly um, you know inspirational and you were very thorough with your presentation uh, i think delegates must have liked it most and i must thank you again for your presence and the representation for this uh, program
I also thank uh, Dr. Guru. I think he's left just now and his wonderful insights will always remain with us and will remain associated forever. I also thank Dr. Amul uh, Kothekar, my former colleague during my training session. Thank you, Dr. Amul, and wish to see you again and again for such uh, uh, academic sessions and uh, uh, Tata Memorial Hospital has always been uh, a place for academics. Actually, a lot of research and academics uh, goes there. And it's uh, like, you know, uh, the aura over there is all full of academics. So thank you very much, Dr. Amol, for your wonderful presence and insights. And I must also thank uh, Dr. Niranjan. Uh, we are from Apollo, so let us stay uh, connected. And let us have exchange programs, uh, academic exchange programs uh, more often than this. And I also thank my colleague, Dr. Aditi, for your presence and uh, your insights on uh, even non-invasive cardiac output monitoring to the echocardiography as a tool for monitoring uh, cardiac output. And, and uh, I hope uh, I again thank all the delegates and uh, the colleagues. Yeah, uh, Achilles, uh, just, just uh, information. Next week, we have an interesting talk on the troubleshooting during the ARDS ventilation. It's on uh, Friday, yeah. 7 o'clock. Okay. So I uh, invite all of you to uh, be a part and uh, join the session. Thank you. Yeah. And thank, thank you, you to my much. colleagues who joined uh, Dr. Vishy uh, and uh, Dr. Dr. Vishy. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And let's have academic exchange with Australia and India. I think we can make a difference. Uh, it is all um, trainee oriented and it is in the best interest of these trainee. I think we should have more often such programs and uh, we'll all remain connected as well with these academic exchanges. With this, I thank you all uh, and uh, stay safe. Bye-bye uh, yes. for now and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank, much. You. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a wonderful day. Thank you.